Greetings, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our weekly Addis Dialogue. With it, I'm Shifat Alako, a Black Agenda Report contributing editor based in the San Francisco Bay Area, and Garrison writes for several newspapers. She also reports for the KPFA Radio Weekend News and co-produces reports and hosts for the Pacifica Radio Network's national show, COVID, race, and democracy, and diplomacy communication director for the Ethiopian American Civic Council and Ethiopian Advocacy Network. That's the largest network in the United States of America. Asqual Tafari was a keynote speaker for the San Francisco, Ethiopian, and Eritrean American March. And I'm joined by both of them from the United States of America to stay with us. All right, uh, Anne Garrison and Asqual Tafari, thank you so much, both of you, for joining me. Thanks for inviting me. Now, first of all, uh, let me come to uh, Asqual. Uh, you wrote an op-ed uh, for Amnesty International, strongly opposing it for having falsely uh, accused the Ethiopian military for a crime it did not commit. What was your complaint to them? And what do you, what do you think should uh, be done by them? Yeah, thank you for that question. Yes, Amnesty International did a hit piece against the Ethiopian military, um, highly decorated, highly respected military that have existed uh, for such a long time, widely known uh, around the globe. But what I said in my op-ed was that the methodology Amnesty International used is, is meager. It's a very, it's unreliable because the sample itself is, is very small. They said that they spoke to 63 people and, um, and then, and that we don't know how these, the sample was, were selected. We don't know how, who they are, where they are. They said that they interviewed, um, the majority of them, but only spoke on the ground to about 15 of them out of the 63. Mm. And then we want to know who they are. We're not told who they are. Um, third, the medical doctors that Amnesty International say that corroborated their story, we don't know who they are. Uh, we haven't been told where they live, um, who these medical professionals are. So we don't know. So it's it's a highly suspect sample. It could be that the sample is TPL of cohorts. Um, so again, the, the sampling is uh, is wrong. And I challenge that. Um, um, and thirdly, this was just really one sided story to implicate the Ethiopian troops. Yeah, you know, they alleged uh, widespread sexual violence and sexual slavery against women in the current conflict in Tigray without actually going and interviewing the government or interviewing the military. Um, so it's one sided story. Um, so if they want to investigate about this alleged atrocities, they should really go into the ground and investigate. Um, in Tigray region and around Tigray region and also investigate the TPLFs themselves that have been known to commit this crime. Okay, now, uh, Anne, let, let me come to you. And yeah. as, a, as, a, as a journalist who talks and writes a lot about uh, global war on terror, how has the U.S. used that um, to influence the rest of the developing world, including Ethiopia? I, I have to laugh at the word influence, which is very, very mild. The U.S. has used the war on terror to dominate the rest of the world, mm. um, particularly the developing world. Um, it has engaged uh, the European world uh, in, its, in its determination to dominate the developing world. Uh, there are bases all over Africa now. The, the Africa Command, which is the last of the USA's Geographic Commands was established in 2008. Um, if you want to talk about, about, about the whole developing world, right now, uh, the U.S. is supporting jihadis in Syria. This is well established. We even had a congressional representative who put 
some legislation before the Congress called Stop Supporting Islamic Terrorists in Syria. Uh, that was Tulsi Gabbard. And in this, the, these jihadis that the US supports in Syria are controlling the most oil rich part of the country. Mm. And US oil companies are in there stealing the oil. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that's what the war in Iraq was about. Um, at least partially. Wars are usually, you know, they happen because a number of people have a number of interests. But in Iraq, Saddam Hussein was granting oil concessions to Russia, China, and France, but not to the US and the UK. And if you remember how things aligned in, mm. the, in the run up to the, <laughs> to the Iraq war, France opposed it. And a lot of us at that time got the idea that this was principled opposition by France. Um, I thought so too, before I learned that Saddam Hussein was, was agreeing to open his oil, oil fields to France, Russia, and China. Um, let's see, Libya. <laughs> Libya was not a war on terror war. Libya was a humanitarian intervention war, the kind that they're threatening you with now. Um, but again, that one was about oil. Um, let's see, let, let me say something else about AFRICOM, the US Africa Command. Um, I belong to an organization called the Black Alliance for Peace. Uh, it's actually, its core are all Africans and African Americans, including people from the continent, but there's also a Black Alliance for Peace supporters group uh, for people who are not of African descent. And stopping AFRICOM, ending the domination of the African continent with this US military command is one of their primary goals. What does, what does the US want in Ethiopia? Same thing it wants everywhere else. It wants its resources, markets, and potentially its uh, labor force. Uh, and I understand that Ethiopia has a particularly large and competent labor force. It, it seems that the US is so ill-bent, uh, so to speak, on discounting the work that the newly government of Ethiopia has put together uh, cases in point, CNN's erroneous report, including the, the one on the national flag carrier, Ethiopian Airlines, and also flirting with sanctions uh, and others, of course. What have you made out of all this, uh, as, as well? Yeah, it's really interesting. And uh, what I see in this is uh, CNN is the most, I, I used to think CNN was the most reliable news agency. Um, but if you look at the, the trend and what's going on in American uh, journalism, they're almost like a propaganda machine. There's a book uh, called Hate Incorporated, Hate INCs, written by Matt Taibbi. You should really look into that book. He presents a compelling argument that during, during Iraq, for example, when, uh, they, when they wanted to topple Saddam Hussein, as Anne just described, Tony Blair at that time in UK wanted to do so, uh, but but couldn't. He couldn't persuade the the, the public to support a regime change. Uh, then came 9/11, and right after 9/11, the United States started uh, uh, propaganda. Basically, they build a consensus. They go out and build a consensus. There is a weapon of mass destruction in Iraq. But what they really wanted was a regime change at that time. And so the US foreign policy makers came up with a doctrine uh, that the US should secure what's called uh, a, pre a preponderance of influence over all countries, meaning having a plan to change a regime of any country not under the direct control of the United States, from Cuba all the way to China. Um, they did the same thing in Libya. In Libya, Gaddafi, uh, well, Tony Blair, UK, uh, and they they were able to topple Gaddafi. If you if you recall, there was Amnesty International report saying that Gaddafi, it, Gaddafi's regime actually was responsible for rape, atrocities, um, dictatorship, and what have you. And 
they were able to galvanize public opinion. Now they have to galvanize public opinion in order to wage a war. And the same thing going back to Iraq when they toppled Saddam Hussein's regime change, they were able to convince the public. I mean, there was all major media reporting there is a weapon of mass destruction, including General Colin Powell testifying under the UN. And, and the travesty of, of it all is they are without regret when they do that. Um, so to me, it's not real journalism, but it is to support uh, a consensus around the government's policy. Um, and you look at most countries such as Libya and Iraq, even Afghanistan, Syria, you see the same thing over and over again. Here, mm. uh, they want to support some sort of a regime change. They use the propaganda machine. So it's not evidence-based. And then reporters like uh, Nima Eldberg, uh, she's really working hard. Uh, she accused uh, of atrocities. She, she used um, uh, no scientific uh, or no forensic studies to validate such uh, an accusation that's even prohibited highly by any United Nations uh, entity. And then the unfortunate part of it is the American public, by and large, is not educated about Africa that much. I mean, they mm. think, you know, most people think Africa is a continent. They don't understand the cultural background, the historical background. So it's easier to convince them. For any democracy to thrive, at minimum, you need education. The education system in the United States of America is really isolated from the rest of the world. So they, the, the people, by and large, don't have a lot of understanding so they seem to believe the news media. Oh, I heard it on CNN. I remembered something else about the war on terror in Africa, which is that now, just recently, the U.S. has introduced troops, U.S. troops in the Demo Democratic Republic of the Congo and said they were going there to fight jihadis. This is ridiculous. Uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is 95% Christian. Mm. Uh, so the idea that ISIS <laughs> is a problem in the Democratic Republic of the Congo is just just ridiculous. Um, you, you, Anna, you, you, you've also written about sanctions. Uh, uh, the U.S. is saying that the sanctions are only for individuals and not for Ethiopia. And why do you think sanctions should be avoided by your government? Sanctions kill. I want to recommend a website sanctionskill.org to anyone who wants to understand sanctions and uh, you can you know become a part of that coalition it's it's a i mean your organization whatever organization may uh, make contact and join that coalition uh includes it includes many groups uh, the black alliance for peace code pink um world beyond war many many of the anti-war organizations that uh, what, what it and those of us talking about this now are trying to make clear is that the U.S. is now using hybrid warfare, um, things like um, censure, sanctions, sanctions is the worst, um, covert operations and special operatives, not uh, you know, there, I don't think there will be any more big troop commitments like there were there were in Afghanistan. I think that'll likely be the last of that type of war. Um, so sanctions are some of the most punishing forms of war, and uh, you know they cause food shortages, medicine shortages. Uh, countries can't get parts for their infrastructure. Um, this is a problem in Venezuela. Venezuela has the largest oil reserves in the world, but it's having a a big shortage of, of fuel because uh, it can't get the elements that it needs to sustain its oil industry. It's very heavy oil, and so it needs light sweet light sweet crude to um, to mix it, to, to mix with its oil, to refine it, and it can't get parts for its refineries. Um, in North Korea, I, I recently did a show, produced an hour of radio for 
the Pacifica Radio Network, which I work for. And one of the uh, one of the instances we covered was um, North Korea, yeah. where a doctor who teaches here at the Harvard Medical School uh, has volunteered in North Korea uh, for some years. And he said <clears throat> that he has operated with used scalpels and gauze that have to be used over, they have to be sterilized and used over and over again. Now, the EU Parliament has adopted a resolution on Ethiopia demanding immediate cessation of hostilities and calling for a wider range of sanctions, including uh, arms embargo. Uh, the resolution also calls on the UN Security Council uh, to consider deploying UN peacekeepers to the region. Does that sound to you like the infringement of uh, Ethiopia's sovereignty? and territorial integrity. Absolutely. Uh, but I don't think it will happen under UN command because Russia and China uh, consistently resist the efforts to censure sanction uh, and intervene in Ethiopia. It's, well, <laughs> you know, unilateral sanctions are, are illegal, so is unilateral military intervention. Um, but as we know, the United States <laughs> doesn't, doesn't have a lot of respect for international law, much to my chagrin. Um, but I, I, don't think that, I don't think there's any danger of a UN peacekeeping mission being imposed on you because Russia and China won't go along with it. And yes, it would be a big violation of your sovereignty. I think I agree with Anne. I mean, for, for that to happen, they definitely have to have the um, agreement from Russia and China. Um, and they keep saying negotiate, negotiate, but we don't negotiate with terrorists. This is <laughs> this is the mantra of the United States themselves. We don't negotiate with terrorists. So it will be an absolute hypocrisy and that's not gonna happen. In terms of UN keeping forces in the region, um, Ethiopia is a sovereign state um, they would have to actually approve uh, uh, unilaterally that they would accept the UN peacekeeping force, and that's not going to happen because it's a functioning government. Ethiopia is a fully newly elected, democratically elected, fully functioning government, and I don't think they're going to allow that. Uh, Ethiopia, as you know, uh, both of you, has recently formed a new legitimate government. What should it do to be more uh, effective, more competitive? It, it is incredible. The first democratically elected government, this is a huge achievement. I said that last week in another interview. I cannot emphasize enough that Ethiopia for the first time, extremely historic, peaceful election, democratic everywhere. Uh, government should really be congratulated for this. Now that they have this, they also have to understand the threat there is in the West especially with the United States of America and Europe, United mm. Kingdom. There's a lot of diplomatic work that needs to be done to change the narrative. And another thing that it, besides congratulating them, I'm very happy with Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. He just gave uh, a leadership training the other day where he says to the appointed ministers that this is your legacy that you're gonna leave for the next generation. It's not power only, but what you do for your country, it's, it's moving, I mean, and so now we are going to probably work on creating jobs, opportunities for women, and uh, implement uh, uh, a policy that gets rid of ethnic uh, federalism. In addition, um, implement some laws that, uh, that would uh, look into justice for all, the rule of law, and uh, women rights, the rights of a girl and woman to get a free education equal to that of the man and uh, economic development for all, I think is key here. And I'm, I'm very encouraged and I'm really hopeful and I pray that we come out of this and become victorious. Mm. Anne? Um, well, I'm going to specifically address Ethiopia's negotiations with the industrialized world. Uh, first of all, I'd say you have, as I understand it, you have a great deal of arable land. Uh, much of it is not under cultivation. I'm sure there are 
there are various food corporations that would like to get a hold of it, but having that much uh, very fertile land uh, and now having the new Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which is likely to make irrigation projects more possible, even if it, it's not going to, to irrigate at the site of the dam, but because it will provide power all over the country, it's likely to make more irrigation projects possible. Um, one of the best ways to remain independent of the West is, is to establish food security, not to be dependent on food imports. And it looks like with all this arable land, Ethiopia has the possibility to do that. Uh, Another is, like I said, I understand you have a very large and efficient labor force. Mm -hmm. So I think, I hope your government will be prepared to protect them um, from exploitation, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, from exploitation by uh, whoever, whatever corporations might establish themselves there. Um, the way that that Eva Morales, the president of Bolivia, who is president of Bolivia and is now, he's still in the government, he, he's no longer president, but um, he has been very, very intelligent and um, effective about his negotiations with the West. The other thing I was gonna say is, is resources. Of course, the West is the industrialized West and even China and Russia are, are interested in whatever resources you have. Um, so I think any contracts, contracts to exploit Ethiopian resources should be transparent. Mm. Ethiopians should know what they are and um, <laughs> what the deal is. Yeah. Uh, finally, let me give you one minute uh, to each of you. What's your message to Ethiopians here and overseas? Uh, to uh, come to the, their country's rescue uh, in the midst of such uh, challenges, pressures from uh, within and without. Yes, um, basically uh, transferring knowledge from the diaspora is very important to our country. Um, to answer your question, what can we do for our country? We can definitely travel to Ethiopia um, and offer um, assistance in terms of um, you know, knowledge sharing, just like the PISCOR, uh, it used to be like, if we could get room and board, I'm sure a lot of intellectuals would really love to come there and offer their services for free. Um, in terms of what I would like to see in the future in terms of economic development, the uh, the Warren of African Initiative is really excellent. You know, it, it, it affords not only just economic independence to the Horn, but uh, a political power it becomes and it also becomes a model to change to change the rest of Africa. Um, we need to lift ourselves from poverty. Um, Yamiba Maso wrote the book called Dead Aid. I recommend everybody oh. read that book in that she argues that there is no country that lifted itself out of poverty by aid. Absolutely none. Oh. So Africa should lift itself up from poverty and become self-sufficient. Otherwise, the flood of imperialism that keeps giving is the same one that will take it away. So let's rise up and become economically independent. Indeed. Um, and what, what's your message to Ethiopians? What's your advice to Ethiopians at home and overseas uh, in the midst of such pressures and foreign meddling in the internal affairs of the country? Well, for one, I would call out these, <laughs> these uh, European saviors <laughs> <laughs> these these governments posturing as European sa saviors of a black African nation. Samantha Power, I think I told you at the beginning, she called a high ministerial meeting uh, of white saviors <laughs> from all the European countries and the United States and Japan, which is more, <laughs> more or less part of that block. Uh, I mean, I, I really think I really think he should just speak out as to how ridiculous and patronizing and um, presumptuous this is. And 
all those things I, I suggested before, food security, making food security a, a goal in particular, as we've been talking a lot about reducing dependence on aid. Um, in, in a large, well, this isn't about the immediate problem, but I think it would take cooperation among many African nations to renegotiate mm -hmm. the debt. I mean, Africa is constantly being drained by, by debt. And that would, that would take cooperation um, by many African countries, I think. Um, here, uh, Asquam mentioned that they're lobbying politicians and so forth, they're particularly black politicians. Um, so since she said that, I will encourage um, making connections with some of the anti-war social justice uh, organizations, particularly the Black Alliance for Peace, the United National Anti-War Coalition, and more. Mm. And if you go to the sanctionskill.org website, the list of organizations that are part of the Sanctions Kill Coalition, they're all organizations that Ethiopians would do well to establish ties with. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I think it seems that Ethiopia, uh, Ethiopians uh, at home and abroad need stronger unity more than ever before at such a critical time, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. We, we need to unite here in the diaspora as well. Hmm. We are doing a great work, by the way, so we should, uh, we should be encouraged back home. Uh, we don't really sleep. I mean, our Unity for Utopia Twittering campaign took down TPLF's Twittering platform at a certain point, and we're 24-7, and we have uh, Telegram going 24-7. So there is yeah. a, a bit of advocacy work. Then diplomacy is needed. We need to be able to convince our enemies, um, be able to dialogue with them and convince them and tell them the truth and expose the truth to them. So much diplomacy is needed as well. Indeed. Well, uh, Anne Garrison and uh, Asquale Tapari, thank you both of you so much for your wonderful perspectives. Take care. Bye. Thanks for having us. Well, dear viewers, with that, we come to the end of today's program. Many thanks for your company so far. Until I see you next time with yet another program, it's goodbye from me, Shifara Lakao.